and a very warm welcome to this edition of Talking Europe. He served two terms as Director General of the World Trade Organization, worked as EU Commissioner for Trade, and that after years as advisor to former European Commission President Jacques Delors. He's currently Honorary President of the Jacques Delors Institute, a Paris-based European think tank. Mr. Pascal Lamy, a very warm welcome to the show. Thanks for hosting me. Uh, now, we've been looking, of course, in recent weeks a lot at this Brexit question. This week, we saw Britain get a new Prime Minister, Theresa May. She campaigned to remain, but has now said Brexit it means Brexit. How do you think she's going to handle the UK's withdrawal from the EU? Well, I mean, it's a very complex situation, uh, and it will take a long time uh, to sort of separate the uh, British egg from the EU omelette. And, and there are many, many, many issues that need to be solved. Uh, so they need a team. They now have a team. Uh, they need a plan. They don't have a plan, uh, and it will take a bit of time for them uh, to uh, build their plan. We're all in between wishing the view started. of the Brits to be respected, that is, out. Okay. Uh, but on the other side, we know and we believe it's not going to be good for them, uh, so it's not going to be good for us either. But let's look first, we'll look at that in a minute, but let's look first at the team indeed being put together. We saw uh, quite a surprise announcement for a lot of us. Boris Johnson, Foreign Secretary, good choice? Well, he will have to learn to behave, uh, which is what foreign ministers do. Uh, they are diplomats. Huh? And uh, the notion that Boris, which I knew as a kid, uh, rather nasty kid, naughty kid, by the way, the, the notion that Boris is heading uh, uh, the one of the best world diplomacies, yeah, is uh, something strange. We'll see. I mean, I think he's, he's clever enough to change his uh, behaviour of uh, permanent... Uh, uh, Kiddish uh, provocation. Uh, as we all know, this former mayor of London was really one of the lead campaigners for a Brexit. Uh, also another appointment, Liam Fox, uh, Secretary for Trade, another Brexiteer, if you like. These appointments, do you think that Theresa May is looking towards what we're calling a hard Brexit, that is, an exit from the EU that really wouldn't have anything to do with the EU or its single market? I think it's too soon to say. Uh, again, one, they have to decide what they want, and second, they have to negotiate with the Europeans who might not want what they want. She will have to behave to the best of the UK interest, this decision having been taken. Now, of course, you always have the question, you know, what if the result of that looks terrible for the United Kingdom? And this is something we, we cannot not think could happen. I think it's a remote possibility. I mean, I think this notion of return which quite a number of uh, notably environmental NGOs have launched in the UK. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of young people, and notably on the environmental side, who say, no, we, we don't want to leave Europe. We, we, we don't want hunting back. We, we like birds. We, we like Europe because we like nature. Mm -hmm. And this is something that will weigh in the negotiation, while probably the news on the economic side won't be good for the year uh, one or two. Well, let's look at that economic angle, because, you know, if they want access to the EU single market, the EU very clearly saying, well, that goes with free movement of yeah. people, and yeah. nobody has an exception to that. Yeah. In that case, if, if the UK does not accept that free movement of movement, it would go to the World Trade Organization, and then it would have uh, uh, trade tariffs, if you like. Yeah. A lot of the Leave campaigners said, well, today, it's not like when they joined in the 60s, the tariffs are low anyway. Yeah, but tariffs is not the main thing. If you want to access to a market in today's world, most of what you have to abide to are non-tariff measures our regulations, our standards on uh, safety of uh, food, of uh, pets, of flowers, and on, for instance, in the financial industry, on a set of prudential regulations. So the problem is not so much tariffs, although a 10% tariff on British-made cars would probably not be that good for the UK industry, and a 15% tariff on whiskey would probably not be that good for, for the Scots, and uh, 170 euros a tonne for lamb or beef would not be that great. But let's leave that aside. The main issue is where the UK is good 
in its economy, which is services, and notably financial services. And I think you're absolutely right. I don't think the Europeans will give a EU passport to British banks, which allows, if you operate from London, to operate throughout the continent. They won't do that without freedom of circulation. And what the referendum said is no to freedom of circulation. I mean, we know that the sort of anti-immigration stance was probably the decisive reason why uh, a million people voted uh, more on the one side than on the other, which is, which is quite a large majority. And now, looking from the European side, in order to protect their own interests, the 27 that remain, if you like, what kind of deal do you think they should try and get with the UK? I mean, it's, it's difficult to say, as long as we do not know what the UK wants. But what the Europeans will not do is uh, change the rules, the basic rules, notably on the internal market, which is free circulation of goods, services, capital and people. This goes with it. This is what the internal market is about. This is why having this with a 450 million consumer size is a big comparative advantage for the European economy in the world, and they won't do that. But I don't think the EU27 will compromise market. where they have a solid, big economic comparative advantage on this planet. And just briefly, in one way, because the UK had a lot of exceptions to the EU rules. We're hearing now from the head of the IMF and indeed the Euro, uh, France's economic minister saying, in a way, the EU, and notably the Eurozone, will be better off without the UK in it. Well, I mean, that's a, it's, it's, it's a point. Uh, I mean, I've been in the European affairs for 15 years of my life, and quite often, for instance... Uh, the French and the Brits were together in slowing political institutional integration of Europe. Uh, I have many examples of that, notably during the negotiation of this uh, famous uh, Maastricht uh, Treaty, where many times the French diplomats and the British diplomats were on the same side to put the brakes on progress which Germany or the Benelux uh, wanted. So it probably will change this. Uh, it might change things on, on taxation, for instance, uh, which is unanimity. Uh, I mean, I've always thought that we need a common corporate tax in Europe. This is unanimity. It wasn't available as long as the Brits were not there. Were there. I think and this is the sort of thing which we now could change. do. Although, although, if UK is damaged by this exist, if then we will be also damaged because whether we like it or not, they are very near to the continent. Indeed. Well, another appointment that created quite a bit of controversy this week was Jose Manuel Barroso taking post of non-executive chairman of Goldman Sachs International. Just to remind our viewers that Barroso is a former president of the European Commission and Goldman Sachs, of course, is one of the world's most powerful banks, one that many see as having helped trigger the financial crisis. Luke Schrego tells us more. Jose Manuel Barroso ran the European Commission for a decade up until 2014. The experience has left him well placed to work for Goldman Sachs, which has set off a storm of controversy by taking him on. One of the most powerful banks in the world, the firm's likely after the access he can provide to those he once worked with, from Angela Merkel to Francois Hollande, Nicolas Sarkozy and Barack Obama. For experts, it's not a surprising move. He's been involved at the heart of the European Commission for 10 years. Unit heads, directors, CEOs, he knows everyone. So of course he's going to be able to monetize his address book. So he's offering his distinguished services to Goldman Sachs. The firm has a reputation for being discreet. It doesn't even have a sign up on its headquarters. While such moves are commonplace in the United States for former politicians and statesmen, it's anathema in Europe, where the practice is deeply frowned on. It feeds the revolt of European citizens against the elites who are selling their souls. It's not the first time, however, and other high-profile characters have done the same. Former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder raised eyebrows when he went to work for Russian energy giant Gazprom. And former British Prime Minister Tony Blair found a job with Saudi oil group Petra Saudi. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Lamy, first of all, your reaction to that appointment uh, of Barroso, do you think it's fair? I think it's a mistake. It's a mistake for political reasons. I mean, not that Goldman Sachs uh, is a bandit, uh, not that uh, Mr. Barroso is a crook, uh, no. I mean, Goldman Sachs is an investment bank. They do what their clients want them to do, sometimes pretty tricky. José Manuel Barroso, I mean, I'm not on his side of politics, but he was elected by the European Parliament and notably by the right of the European Parliament President Commission twice. He is a member of the European uh, Party, which is on the centre right. So, a respectable guy. But this connection is, I think, not right because it gives the impression that you know these people don't care about possible conflicts of interest, neither on the Goldman Sachs side nor on the Barroso side. I think the rules of the EU Commission, and I was an EU Commissioner. <laughs> There are rules that say what you can do and it's, not do when you leave the Commission. You have to wait 18 months after, after being I there to the be rules, a lobbyist. I think the rules should be, should, should be changed. But I does think, he break the rules? Because you have to wait 18 months and he's gone 20 months. I don't think he's broken the rule. Uh, but the fact that the emotion this creates mm -hmm. shows that the rules, rules are to probably change. to be changed. Now, we heard in that report that, uh, you know, possibly Goldman Sachs is looking at Boris's address book. Is that why the bank would want him? Like, of course. So I mean, of course. what does the I mean, EU risk losing with this? Of course. Point? I mean, most of these former politicians that join business, and Gert Schroeder, and Tony Blair, and José Manuel Barroso, and many others did it, I mean, they're not, they're not hired uh, because of their formidable expertise in uh, the business. They're hired because they have a good address book and they can open doors. I, I know that. I know that. I mean, so the EU it's, it's, it's something I, I personally <laughs> choose not to do. But then what does the EU risk losing with this appointment? I think it gives the impression mm. uh, that, uh, you know, these fat cats down there don't even care about Conflict well, of interest. We've heard that even from France's uh, foreign trade minister, Matthias Feckel, saying it really shows that the elites, the banks, are being put before the people and showing an yeah, image of old I mean, Europe. I think this is a bit of a demagogic presentation. You know, this notion that elite versus the people, we've heard that a few times in history and uh, it usually did not lead to very nice situations. So I don't buy this. I mean, I recognize there is miscontent and frustration among some people because uh, there is too much unemployment. Turning this into a sort of elite versus uh, the people, uh, I don't think is the right thing to do. But what Barroso and Goldman Sachs just did can give water uh, to the mill of those who pretend that this is the problem. Can that appointment be stopped? Do you think they might reverse their decision? I mean, I think at the end of the day... They'll have to, uh, because Goldman Sachs will probably realize uh, that that's not good uh, for their image, uh, for their client relationship. And they hired Barroso because of the notion that they had to be to improve their client relationship. So if on the other side they, they damage it, I think at the end of the day, they'll have to find an arrangement with a sort of fig leave well, uh, that uh, doesn't. No, that's not too sour for either either of the parties. Well, just before we move on from the issue of banks, when you look at the Italian banks, uh, they look like they're really struggling at the mo moment, something like 360 billion euros of bad debts. They're looking uh, possibly to the EU for a banking bailout. Do you think that's necessary? Do you think this is the next euro crisis that's around the corner? Well, I mean, we know there is a problem uh, with, uh, with uh, Italian banks in, uh, in prudential terms, uh, but there are now at the level of the union, which was not the case when the uh, crisis started in 08, there is a sort of anti-fire system uh, with a firewall which should normally prevent uh, any serious incident. Uh, but this is uh, for sure, this is an issue that will be on the agenda uh, after the summer break. OK, something to look forward to, to then. Uh, we were noticing there perhaps that appointment of Barroso adding uh, perhaps to your scepticism, which we've seen growing across the EU really a lot in recent months and years. Also, we're seeing the rise of far-right parties. Uh, October, at the end of the summer, we're also going to be looking at October 2nd, uh, a rerun of the presidential polls there. Last May, we saw Alexander uh, van der Bellen narrowly beat the far-right candidate Norbert Hofer. 
How do you think it's going to go in October? Do you think... I don't know. First right wing I know, president. I know what I hope, <laughs> uh, but I don't know the result. Uh, you know, the Australians will have to decide. But it's it's interesting that, I mean, in a country that has been governed for decades by centre left and centre right, the two candidates for the position of president, which which is not like the president of France or the U.S. constitutionally. Uh, but the two candidates are one from the Greens, uh, uh, which looks like sort of more extreme left in an uh, Austrian context, and one from the FPÖ, uh, which is the extreme right. So it, I think it says something on the fact that the traditional European uh, centre-left, centre-right, Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, uh, is in trouble. Mm. So how do you see the, the future of the EU? It's gone a long way from the idea of the founding fathers. Are you hopeful that it will, the 27 will stick together? I think we, we, we will have to, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, Europe is, matters because of its values. Europe matters because of its identity. Uh, and I've, you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in Brussels and quite a large time outside Brussels. The European identity is often much clearer in the eyes of non-Europeans than it is in the eyes of Europeans. And non-Europeans still look at Europe like something which is desirable. OK, Mr Pascal Lamy, thanks so much. We're going to have to leave it there. That uh, brings us to the end of this show. Thanks also, of course, to you at home for having watched. Uh, do stay with us, So We'll be back after the news with a bit of best of looking at the main issues that have rocked the EU over the last year.